and uh, the third presentation will be by Anthony Stipp from the Dutch Butterfly Conservation. Uh, Anthony, welcome. Thank you. I'll start sharing my screen. I hope uh, things are working well this time. Um, yes, my name is Antoni Stipp and I work as an uh, ecologist uh, for a Dutch butterfly conservation. And uh, I want to tell you something about bumblebees in Dutch meadows. So we're actually moving from the mountains to the lowland areas in the Netherlands. And um, before I um, start my talk, it's good to mention this is work of a team of uh, several people. And I uh, mentioned a few, uh, Marco, Jens, Vincent, and Linda, they uh, all contributed a lot to this project. Uh, so thank you in advance. Um, talking about uh, moderately nutrient rich grasslands, we have a lot of them in the Netherlands. Actually the Netherlands, uh, large parts of the Netherlands are grasslands in agricultural use. But if you uh, look to the grasslands, uh, which are managed as a nature reserve, we have about, uh, over uh, 110,000 of hectares of uh, grasslands of several types of moderately nutrient-rich grasslands. And uh, they are um, uh, hay meadows, about 16,000 hectares, uh, flora and fauna-rich grasslands, a, lit a lot more, 72,000 hectares, and uh, also meadowbird grasslands, about to uh, 23,000 of hectares. And these grassland types, we actually don't know um, whether bumblebees make use of them, which species make use of them. And uh, well, that's good to know if we talk about conservation of bumblebees in the Netherlands. So this is a picture showing you uh, one of the types of the grasslands, um, uh, flora and fauna rich grassland. Um, uh, this one is uh, uh, quite flower rich, but low in species richness, but there is a huge variation among the grasslands uh, present here. Uh, we did a project which is called Weide Hommelrijk, and uh, if you translate it into English, it's, it's something like uh, meadows uh, rich in bumblebees, in which the main question is, uh, which value do these moderately rich grassland types have for bumblebees in the Netherlands? And uh, it was uh, set up by two parts of the project. So we did monitoring uh, bumblebee surveys and we, uh, uh, there was also an important part of exchange of knowledge. And it took place the last couple of years, starting in 2018, and it was um, funded by several uh, funds, which are shown below. So we monitored bumblebees in two years in 11 areas uh, in the province of South Holland. I will show you a map in a minute. 11 areas in 2018, and this work was done by Marco Tanis. And uh, in 2019, uh, we added another four areas, which sums up to 15 areas in total. And we looked to four grassland types, the three mentioned before, the hay meadows, the flora and fauna rich grasslands, the meadowbird grasslands, and we also added road verges to have some kind of impression what's happening in the landscape. So here is the map, as promised. Um, on the left side of the screen, you see uh, the province of South Holland and the 11 locations scattered throughout the landscape. These were measured in 2018. And uh, additionally, we measured four more in 2019. And uh, well, they are, for example, uh, close to Amsterdam. Uh, for the Dutch people, this is in the Weerribbe. Uh, this is uh, in Eemland. And the one south to Rotterdam is close to Tiengemeente, at gebied de Laagjes. Um, well, how do these grasslands look like? Something like this. Um, Meadowbird grasslands in the Netherlands are actually uh, a quite nutrient-rich grasslands with, uh, well, also a very dense vegetation structure. But uh, some parts are uh, quite flower-rich. Hay meadows look something like this. We have them in several forms. This is an example from uh, the Weerribben. And here you see a, a hay meadow in the summer uh, where it is mown, but some of the uh, uh, meadow is uh, left uncut. And this is a, uh, well, profit of pole for bumblebees, actually. So what we did, we carried out transect counts, 10-minute uh, uh, transect counts of 
200 meter long uh, transects and five meter wide. We also did um, random walks to establish uh, species richness, but in this talk, I will only show you the data from the 10 transect counts. And it's good to mention, we also measured flower richness in uh, these transects in uh, square meter plots. And we analyzed this by uh, generalized, generalized linear mixed models on abundance and species richness. I'm not going into much detail about that. Well, schematically, uh, it looks something like this in a landscape. So in green, you see the parcels and they are mainly surrounded by ditches, by water. And uh, the parcels uh, can be entered from a road in most cases, or sometimes even from uh, by boat. And um, the parcels are small, but very long. Um, so in most cases, we subdivided the, the 200 meter transect into four sections of 50 meters. Well, this is how such a landscape looks like. Welcome in the Netherlands. It's uh, water all around. Small parcels, as you can see, uh, small but long. And uh, this is an example of the, uh, one of the areas uh, north of Amsterdam, the Wormer and Jesperveld. Well, um, this ended up into a list of uh, almost 700 uh, bumblebees we recorded. And um, there are, uh, they, it consists of eight species in total. There are quite common species uh, in general, uh, but uh, one I, I want to mention is uh, Bombus muscorum. It's also in the Netherlands, a rare species. It's on the red, red list, and we found it in, uh, actually in all of the grass and types, not in high numbers, but it is present. Uh, and it's good to mention that this is mainly uh, because of some of the areas where Bombus muscorum uh, uh, appear to be present. And at least for the, this area, so the uh, area north of Amsterdam, it was not known before to live here. So um, if you're going to look in these grasslands, sometimes you will get a surprise. Um, if you look at uh, bumblebee species richness in the four grassland types we have uh, uh, surveyed, then uh, one thing uh, immediately appears that there is a significant lower species richness of bumblebees in the meadowbird grasslands. Um, uh, and it's significantly different from all the other three types. And you see that uh, the hay meadows tend to be the most species rich grasslands. Well, you then look to abundance and we split this uh, from, uh, we split the spring uh, round uh, of surveys and the summer round, then this is uh, the pattern we found. Actually, again, the meadow bird grasslands um, are very, have a very low abundance of bumblebees. And this is a significant difference from all of the other grassland types. And again, you see there is uh, quite some variation uh, between the grasslands uh, we uh, sampled, actually. For example, the hay meadows, some are very good, but some are quite bad. Um, but in the end, it uh, uh, appears to be this pattern. We also looked to the flower abundance in, uh, in all these transacts we, we, we uh, surveyed. And uh, then you see, actually, interestingly, that there is, uh, again, um, uh, this pattern of uh, quite some flowers being abundant in spring, but uh, uh, lots fewer um, uh, flowers being abundant in, in summer. And, um, and there are actually, uh, we couldn't find any significant differences uh, b between them um, because uh, there was quite some correlation between grassland type and flower abundance. So uh, it was difficult to distinguish in the tests. But okay, this, these are the patterns in flower richness in the plots we've measured. So if you look around in these grasslands, um, uh, we have seen that there is quite some uh, improvement possible of the management in these grasslands. And it's good to, uh, to mention that uh, I'm not blaming someone of, uh, of the management taking place nowadays. It's, it's very difficult to be a site manager, a nature manager in the Netherlands because you have loads of interests to, to weigh, so to say. Uh, but on the left hand, uh, on your left hand, uh, you see, for example, a, a meadow bird grassland after the breeding season of the meadow birds, and you see that um, a liquid manure was applied in this grassland. Um, of course, this is not uh, very very well for bumblebees. There is nothing uh, to find actually, no flowers present. 
Um, but if you ask me as an ecologist, this is also not very favorable for meadowbirds because when the meadowbirds arrive again in the next spring, they arrive in a slightly more nutrient rich grassland with a slightly denser vegetation structure. So, um, um, and these changes are going very slowly, but uh, in the end, we end up in grasslands which are too dense and uh, too nutrient rich for both meadowbirds and for bumblebees. So there are quite some, uh, some issues to solve here. Um, in the other pictures, you see actually um, what's happening in spring when these grasslands, when most of these grasslands are mown, they are fully mown. So there is nothing actually left, no resources left. Although you see in the right bottom right picture that um, either after mowing some uh, small plants start to flower again. So white clover, for example, and uh, uh, leontodon species. Um, but uh, there is some improvement possible in these grasslands, uh, both for bumblebees and other pollinators, and also for, um, well, other fauna, so to say, which uh, inhabits these grasslands. Um, it's good to mention uh, this problem actually in the Netherlands uh, is quite widespread. So the dominance of Holtus lanatus, um, for the Dutch people, it's uh, gestreepte witbol. Um, in many meadowbird grasslands, this is the picture you see later in the season, so in June uh, mainly. And it's caused by um, um, year after year delayed mowing, so late mowing because of the meadowbirds being present, uh, quite some fertilization being uh, applied in these grasslands, and the absence of grazing during spring because, well, we have uh, some uh, regulations for all these grassland management types and they uh, actually make it uh, not uh, very favorable uh, to uh, graze these grasslands. So if you sum this up, meadowbird grasslands, actually uh, we find that uh, these grasslands are quite poor in bumblebees, both in species richness and in abundance. And uh, it's caused by a quite intensive uh, management of these grasslands, although they are managed for meadowbirds, but after the breeding season of these birds, uh, things tend to be, um, again, uh, uh, focused on agricultural uh, purposes. And, uh, well, this is uh, quite a problem in the Netherlands. We found the highest abundance of uh, bumblebees and the species richness in the hay meadows. And if we're talking about improvements, well, uh, it's uh, really um, possible to increase the flower richness in these grasslands. And for example, it can be uh, created by uh, phased management, phased mowing of grasslands or phased grazing of these grasslands. And it's very important to uh, mention that uh, there are lots of gradients, uh, although it's a flat country, there are lots of gradients present in these grasslands, for example, in the ditches, in the, um, um, the, the banks, uh, uh, the dikes surrounding the landscape. So there is, uh, and these gradients are very important for uh, bumblebees and other pollinators uh, to find resources to be able to, um, uh, to survive in these landscapes. So my um, advice would be to the managers, cherish these gradients. Well, it seems to be that this, this, is, this could be a quite a depressing story, but I'm uh, positive, uh, um, uh, I'm, I'm in positive mind. Uh, so I formulated five steps forward, actually, what we can do as uh, entomologists, ecologists, bumblebee uh, lovers. First of all, um, I think it's good to start talking with the site manager and maybe also the neighbors, the, the neighboring landowners. Talk with them. Uh, stress the importance of uh, the grasslands for the bumblebees. Um, and this is also a very uh, good task for us and uh, try to identify valuable terrain elements for flora and fauna in these grasslands and also identify which species are using the landscape. And if you have both um, uh, in mind, you can identify management bottlenecks also together talking with the site managers, you can identify management bottlenecks and try to solve them. Because in many cases, improvements are possible. Um, and yes, it's difficult, uh, especially in a small country with um, many interests on a small scale, but it is possible to improve management for um, nature in general, but especially for bumblebees. 
And uh, of course, uh, it's good to evaluate and monitor the effect of the management actions uh, because only then we learn what profits the bum, uh, what profits bumblebees in these landscape, what helps them. Um, and I actually should add another one: publish about the results of your uh, of, of your monitoring and evaluation because it's important for all of us in Western Europe, at least, to learn from um, uh, cases uh, in Western Europe how we can manage these grasslands, uh, valuing both uh, flora aspects and uh, uh, important fauna aspects. So um, to, to end up, uh, we uh, published an end report of this project. It is, unfortunately for all of you uh, who don't speak Dutch, it is in Dutch, so I'm sorry for that. Um, we included uh, uh, much of the knowledge we have about these uh, bumblebees uh, living in grasslands in the Netherlands. For example, we um, updated some uh, distribution maps of uh, 11 uh, species. And it's good to mention that um, the work of Marco is uh, published in uh, Basic and Applied Ecology uh, last year. And it's not only about bumblebees, it's about uh, hoverflies as well. Um, but it's good to uh, to uh, to read this um, this information, and by this we share our knowledge to all of you. So thank you for uh, for listening. And uh, if you have any questions who, which are not addressed, uh, could not be addressed now, you can also send me an email later. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Anthony, for uh, for this presentation. So. There are several uh, several questions. So there's one question by Erik Ma Mahu. Um, would you say uh, that doing improving uh, improving management on meadow birds grasslands, specifically for bumblebees, conflicts with the work being done on meadow birds themselves? Yes. Um... It's a good question because uh, it's um, uh, these grasslands are, um, uh, of course, mainly managed for for uh, for meadow birds. That's the main focus in the management uh, of these grasslands. Um, so um, yes, it's good that the site managers keep doing that. But um, besides that, it's still possible to um, to to make some improvements in these grasslands for bumblebees. And of course, it's uh, these are uh, small scale uh, measurements, so to say. Uh, so, uh, for example, um, mowing uh, some small parts of the grasslands uh, later in the season can already help uh, surviving uh, one or two bumblebee queens or, or several workers in such a landscape. Um, and uh, more phased management of the um, the meadowbird grasslands after the breeding season of the meadow meadowbirds also will help. Um, these uh, uh, bumblebee colonies, because this is midsummer, this is the peak time of uh, of bumblebees, uh, bumblebee colonies. Um, so I think it's possible, um, even um, when you manage these grasslands for meadow birds, it's meadow birds. It's possible to also help bumblebees. Okay, thank you. Another question. So despite the meadow birds grasslands lacking diversity, do they support sp species not seen elsewhere? Um, that's a good question. No, it's uh, what uh, we mainly found, uh, found uh, common species in these grasslands. So for example, Bombus terrestris, Bombus pascorum, and in uh, a single a few cases we found Bombus muscorum, uh, but it was really uh, restricted to a few uh, sites actually in the Netherlands. Um, so in general, these are um, common species occurring in these meadowbird grasslands. But to me, as an ecologist, uh, these common species also need to be uh, to be um, uh, considered as important because it's some kind of uh, um, basic quality of a landscape. If they, uh, if these species can live in such a landscape, uh, it tells a story about the quality of such landscapes. Okay, thank you. There's a question from uh, from Andre Kraner from the JKI Institute for Bee Protection in Brunswick. And the question is, have you observed something about the nesting habitat preferences of uh, Bombus muscorum? And that's a difficult question to answer, I think. <laughs> no, we, we didn't uh, uh, record this. And uh, um, 
yeah, we know that uh, in these, for example, in, in, in one of the areas in Wormer and Jesperveld, so north of Amsterdam, these are uh, quite, this is quite a wet area. So wet grasslands with high water tables. Um, and um, in these grasslands, uh, Bombus muscorum was quite uh, abundant, which was a new finding actually. And um, the field, uh, the, the field workers actually uh, wondered where do these bumblebees nest? And uh, the hypothesis is that they nest in the dikes surrounding uh, these grasslands. But um, that's, this is something uh, interesting which needs to be um, uh, addressed uh, later, I think. Okay, thank you. And uh, a, a third or a fourth question, I think uh, it's a question about the, the value of roadside verges. So I, I think one of the, the graphs showed that uh, roadsides are often more important than the agricultural field themselves. Is true. that true? And what's well, it, it depends on the landscape, actually, where, where you are in the Netherlands. But uh, we do know that, uh, you know, the Netherlands is a small country being uh, densely populated, um, efficiently used, actually. Uh, so what we see in general is that uh, road verges and uh, dikes and uh, um, uh, ditches, for example, or, or the size of ditches, uh, they uh, tend to increase in importance for um, pollinators in general and uh, bumblebees. I think, uh, I think in uh, specificity. So um, yes, they are they are important, and I think they become more and more important because in the general farmland uh, surrounding uh, these road verges, um, food sources and nesting availability nest availability sites uh, are uh, becoming incre increasingly uh, absent, actually. Okay, thank you.